Good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the newspaper dated 20th of May 2023. In this plate here are the list of articles that we will take up for discussion today. Go through it. Now we will start with the first article discussion. See, this news article is about a study published in the journal JAMA Network Open about arsenic pollution. Earlier, it was thought that ingesting high levels of arsenic from contaminated water had a negative impact on humans. But the new study has highlighted that even consuming low levels of arsenic can affect the cognitive functions of children, adolescents and young adults. The study terms chronic arsenic poisoning as the silent pandemic as it leads to reduction in grey matter in the brain and it also affects concentration in children and young adults. This is about the news article. In this context, in our discussion, we will see in detail about arsenic poisoning. Then we will see what are the permissible limits of arsenic then the effects of arsenic contamination and finally we will also see the arsenic contamination status in india before getting into the discussion i have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion for your reference please go through it first let us start our discussion by seeing what arsenic is and what are its applications arsenic is a naturally occurring chemical element that is found in the earth's crust in its pure form, arsenic is a silver grey metalloid but it is more commonly found in combination with other elements such as sulphur or oxygen. So what are the sources of arsenic? Arsenic exists in both organic and inorganic form. Organic arsenic compounds are generally considered less toxic and they occur naturally in certain marine organisms such as fish and shellfish. These organic forms of arsenic are generally considered to have a low risk to human health compared to the inorganic arsenic compounds. Inorganic arsenic compounds are typically more toxic and they pose a higher risk to human health. These forms of arsenic can be found naturally in the environment such as rock, soil and groundwater. Inorganic arsenic can also result from human activities. Here I mentioned that arsenic is found in groundwater, right? So when crops are irrigated with contaminated water or when livestock are fed with contaminated water, then dietary sources like cereals, vegetables, meat, poultry and even dairy products could be a source of arsenic. Last major source of arsenic is tobacco smoking. People who smoke tobacco can be exposed to natural inorganic arsenic content of tobacco. This is because the tobacco plants can take arsenic naturally present in the soil. Having seen the sources of arsenic, now let us see the applications of arsenic. See, arsenic is used industrially as an alloying agent as well as in the processing of glass, pigments, textiles, paper, metal adhesives, wood preservatives and ammunition. Also, arsenic is used in high tanning process and to a limited extent it is also used in pesticides, feed additives and pharmaceuticals. Having seen the basics about arsenics, now let us see what is arsenic poisoning. See, arsenic poisoning also known as arsenic toxicity or arsenioxis occurs when a person is exposed to high levels of arsenic. This could happen either through ingestion, inhalation or even through skin contact. It can result from various sources like contaminated drinking water, food or occupational exposure in industries that use or produce arsenic based compounds. Arsenic poisoning has various negative impacts. In this, we will first see the negative impacts of arsenic on human health. In case of acute poisoning or high levels of arsenic exposure, then people will experience symptoms like abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea and in severe cases, organ failure and death. Also, as said in this news article, in case of chronic poisoning or long-term exposure to small doses of arsenic, there will be impaired neurological functions. 
chronic poisoning also has other impacts. It affects the skin leading to lesions, discoloration and thickening. It also leads to respiratory and cardiovascular problems. In rare cases, it might also lead to cancer. Then, in case of arsenic exposure during pregnancy, there is an increased risk of birth defects. Finally, arsenic poisoning also impacts the immune system. See, these are some of the health impacts of arsenic poisoning. Now, what are the environmental impacts of arsenic poisoning? Firstly, it affects groundwater. Then, it contaminates the soil leading to reduction in agricultural production. Last one is the social impacts. So the first social impact is impaired livelihood. People exposed to arsenic have reduced cognitive function and concentration levels. So this affects their overall well-being and thus it reduces their chances to get a fruitful employment. The next is the increased health care burden to individual and the government. The last one is social stigma. As I mentioned before, people exposed to chronic arsenic poisoning have skin lesions. Due to this condition, they might face social stigma. So these are some of the impacts of arsenic poisoning. See, even though arsenic has various industrial applications, it also has various potential ill effects as we just saw. So we have set a permissible level at which the impact of arsenic is negligible. Internationally, the World Health Organization publishes a guideline value for arsenic in drinking water. The current recommended limit of arsenic in drinking water is 10 microgram per liter. WHO also states that efforts must be taken to keep the concentrations of arsenic as low as reasonably possible and if possible well below the guideline value. In case of India, the permissible limit of arsenic in absence of an alternative source is 50 microgram per litre. Finally, let us see the present level of arsenic contamination status in India. Look at this map. This map depicts the area affected by arsenic poisoning. The occurrence of arsenic in groundwater was first reported in 1980 in West Bengal. Apart from West Bengal, arsenic contamination in groundwater has been found in the states of Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Haryana, Jharkhand, Karnataka, Punjab and Uttar Pradesh. The occurrence of arsenic in the states of Bihar, West Bengal and Uttar Pradesh is in alluvial formations. But in the state of Chhattisgarh, it is in the volcanic rocks. So this is about the arsenic contamination status in India. So this is all that I wanted to discuss regarding this news article. In this discussion, we saw in detail about arsenic. We saw what are its applications. Then we saw what is arsenic poisoning and we saw some of its impacts. Then we also saw what is the permissible levels of arsenic and finally about the arsenic contamination status in India. With this, now we will move on to the next article discussion. Look at this article from the editorial page. By looking at the title itself, we can say that this particular article is talking about the SDG, that is Sustainable Development Goals. See, recently the city of Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh has adopted the localization of the UN mandated Sustainable Development Goals. This was followed by the release of its Voluntary Local Review, that is VLR, of progress towards achieving the SDGs. Note that Bhopal became the first city in India to release this VLR and to adopt such localization of SDGs. So in this backdrop only this editorial is written. Now in this discussion we will learn about the SDGs and we will also understand the important points provided in this editorial. Before that make a note of the syllabus relevant to this discussion. First we will understand about SDG. See, Sustainable Development Goals came into existence at the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development and this conference was held at Rio de Janeiro in 2012. The main objective of the SDGs is to produce a set of universal goals that will help humanity to address the environmental, political and economic challenges that we are currently facing. The SDGs are designed to bring the world to several life-changing zeros. 
such as zero poverty, zero hunger, zero AIDS and zero discrimination against women and girls. Note that the UN SDGs have 17 goals, 169 targets and this breaks down to 306 national indicators. They are well integrated goals which means any action in one area will affect the outcomes in other areas. See, the UN resolution on SDGs specifies some mechanisms for the monitoring, review and reporting of progress towards achieving the goals. This was incorporated as a measure of accountability towards the people. So as a part of this mandate, the member states report their progress through a voluntary national review. And apart from the national level review, local and regional governments are also encouraged to submit their own subnational reviews. This subnational review is termed as voluntary local review. As we saw earlier, recently Bhopal has released its voluntary local review. Having understood this, now we will see what this editorial says. See, firstly, the editorial gives us some insights about India's progress towards achieving the SDGs. The author says that India has made a commendable effort towards the adoption, localization and achievement of the SDGs. In the year 2020, the Niti Aayog has presented India's second voluntary national review at the UN's high-level political forum. Apart from this, the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation has published a National Indicator Framework or NIF for the review and monitoring of the SDGs. In addition to these efforts, we can also track the progress by looking at the data provided by the Niti Aayog report. The Niti Aayog's report says that at least 23 states and union territories have prepared a vision document based on SDGs and almost all of them have initiated steps to localize the SDGs. Despite these hard efforts, it has taken a long time for us to get India's first voluntary local review at the city level. Now, why is the voluntary local review so important? See. The cities are the most important stakeholders towards achieving the SDGs. This is because at least 65 percentage of the 169 targets of SDGs can't be achieved without the engagement of local urban stakeholders. So, engaging the local urban stakeholders is a much needed one at this point of time. So, here is where VLR comes into picture. See, the VLR is a tool that helps us to demonstrate how local actions are leading to equitable and sustainable ways of transformation. To put it simply, the VLR helps us to monitor the local actions towards achieving the SDGs. So now before concluding our discussion, let us understand few aspects of the Bhopal's localization plan. First of all, know that Bhopal's VLR is the result of a collaboration between the Bhopal Municipal Corporation, UN Habitat and a collective of over 23 local stakeholders. The authorities have mapped 56 developmental projects. These projects are to be carried out as part of the SDGs across the three pillars such as people, planet and prosperity. In such mapping exercises, projects such as building, basic infrastructure and resilience have emerged as a top priority. See, the in-depth quantitative assessment also highlights Bhopal's outstanding performance in solid waste management practices. In addition to this, the analysis also points out the areas where Bhopal needs to work much harder in the coming years. Overall, VLR of Bhopal gives us a picture about Bhopal's action towards achieving the SDGs. So this is about Bhopal's localization plan. See, the voluntary local review is a remarkable opportunity for Indian states to showcase their work at a global platform. So, like Bhopal, other cities should also showcase their urban innovations and collaborations to the world through VLRs. That's all regarding this discussion. If you want to add more relevant points to this, mention them in the comments. We encourage you to share your knowledge with your fellow aspirants. 
with this note let me move on to the next article discussion look at this article the reserve bank of india yesterday announced that it has decided to withdraw the 2000 rupees note from circulation under its clean note policy in this regard we will see why such a decision has been taken what is the clean note policy and how this decision will impact the banks first we will look at the reason behind the withdrawal of 2000 rupees note see the 2000 rupees note was introduced in november 2016 under section 241 of the rbi act 1934 the main objective behind the introduction of this 2000 rupees note is to meet the currency requirement of the country after the demonetization as time went by this objective was fulfilled and the currencies of other denominations were also available in adequate quantities to meet the currency requirements hence rbi stopped printing the 2000 rupees denomination notes in 2018 19 itself and finally yesterday official announcement of rbi regarding the withdrawal of rupees 2000 note came out so the rbi has decided to withdraw rupees 2000 notes from circulation so this it has done under the clean note policy so in this regard we will learn about the clean note policy see the clean note policy was introduced by rbi in the year 1999 the main objective of this policy is to provide good quality currency notes and coins to citizens meanwhile it also envisages removing the soiled and torn notes from the circulation so under this policy only now the rbi has decided to withdraw rupees 2000 notes moving on we'll see what are the directions issued by rbi in this regard and how this withdrawal process will take place see the rbi has instructed all the banks to discontinue the issuance of rupees 2000 note with immediate effect it was also directed to reconfigure the atm machines of the banks accordingly now you may have few questions in your mind like i have 2000 rupees notes what to do with that and will it be valid from today how to exchange this note so on and so forth i'll answer this questions one by one firstly if you have rupees 2000 notes don't worry because these 2000 notes will remain as a legal tender till 30th of september legal tenders are nothing but the official currency used within the country you can deposit the 2000 rupees note in your bank account or you can also exchange those notes in any bank branch or from the issuance departments of 19 regional offices of the rbi but wait don't rush to the banks now the banks and regional offices of the rbi will begin this exchanging process only after 23rd of may and it will continue this process till 30th of september 2023 This time limit has been placed to avoid the disruption of the regular activities of bank branches. We have ample amount of time to change the notes, so don't panic and try to exchange all your notes in a single time. I say this because you can change rupees two thousand notes only up to a limit of twenty thousand per day at a time. Also know that this is not the first time RBI is withdrawing such currency notes. Earlier in 2014 RBI withdrew all banknotes issued prior to 2005 from circulation but RBI has announced that these notes will continue to be legal tender but the legal tender status of rupees 2000 notes after September 30th remains unclear and we may soon expect a clarification from RBI side so this we have to wait and watch Finally what are the impacts that will be faced by the banks because of this decision as a result of this withdrawal of rupees 2000 notes the amount of deposits with the banks will increase gradually in short time this is because people may deposit some money in this exchange process this will ease the pressure on deposit rate hikes which means the banks need not increase their interest rates to attract more deposits and it will result in moderation in short term interest rates which is beneficial for banks so that's all regarding this news article discussion now let us take up the next article see this news article says that the chief justice of india mr d y chandrachud has administered the oath of office to justices prashant kumar mishra and K V Vishwanathan. With this, 
द सुप्रीम कोर्ट इज बैक टू इट्स फुल सैंक्शन स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ थर्टी फोर जजेस दिस इज अबाउट द न्यूज आर्टिकल इन दिस कॉन्टेक्स्ट इन आर डिस्कशन टूडे वी विल रिवाइज अबाउट द अपॉइंटमेंट ऑफ जजेस टू द सुप्रीम कोर्ट द प्रोसीजर फॉलोड फॉर द अपॉइंटमेंट ऑफ जजेस ऑफ सुप्रीम कोर्ट हैज एवॉल्ड ओवर टाइम Presently, we have the collegium system for making appointments to the higher judiciary. Before the collegium system evolved, we had the constitution to aid us. See, Article one hundred and twenty-four of the Constitution deals with the appointment of the Chief Justice of India and other judges of the Supreme Court. The article states that the President appoints judges after consultation with the judges of the Supreme Court. The article also says that the president should consult with the Chief Justice of India while appointing the judges of the Supreme Court. If you notice the wording here, there is no mention of the collegium system. Also note that the collegium system did not come into being due to law made by the Parliament. Then, how did the collegium system come into being? Actually, the collegium system came into being due to a series of Supreme Court judgments. these judgments are popularly called the judges case this is all about the evolution of the process of appointment of supreme court judges with this brief introduction let us see the step by step procedure involved in the appointment of supreme court judges firstly the collegium system recommends the list of names it thinks fit for appointment as judges for the supreme court the recommendation is forwarded to the government then the government after going through the names recommend to the president the names which it thinks fit for appointment as judges finally the recommended names by the government are appointed by the president as judges of the supreme court of a country here a question arises whether the names recommended by the supreme court have to be accepted by the government here note that the government can return the names back to the collegium if it finds any objection to the names proposed and the government must give in writing the reason for rejecting the names the collegium will now go through the reasons given by the government for the non approval of the names here collegium can again reiterate the same names to the government now the government as per the supreme court judgment in the advocates on record association versus union of india case 1993 popularly known as the second judges case has no other option but to forward the names to the president for appointment so from this we can see that the government has only the power to ask the collegium to reconsider the proposed names only once if the collegium reiterates the same names then the government has no other option other than forwarding the reiterated name to the president for appointment the basic tenet behind the system of collegium is that the judiciary should have primacy over the government in matters of appointments and transfers in order to remain independent this is done to safeguard the independence of judiciary in the country so this is all about the appointment of judges of supreme court now let us take up the next article for our discussion now look at this article here the news is that the capital markets regulator sebi has proposed to amend the current rules governing alternate investment funds this is done to strengthen the corporate governance mechanisms as per the proposal of sebi category 1 and category 2 aifs should not borrow funds directly or indirectly for the purpose of making investments so this is the crux of the article given here in this context let us learn about the alternate investment funds see the alternate investment fund is a special investment category that generally refers to the collection of pooled investment funds here the term pooled investment funds are nothing but the aggregated funds that are gathered from multiple investors and created as a giant portfolio now imagine you and a group of your friends so you all decide to pool your money together to invest in different opportunities instead of each person investing individually you all contribute your funds into a single investment portfolio 
this collection of pooled funds is what is called the alternative investment fund now the interesting thing about aifs is that they don't invest in traditional options like stocks bonds or cash instead the money in aifs is invested in various alternative investment types such as hedge funds private equity venture capital and other unique investment opportunities know that aifs can be formed as a company or limited liability partnership or even trust also alternate investment funds should need to adhere to the sebi regulations 2012 now moving on to see about the categories of aifs as per sebi the alternate investment fund is put into three categories such as category 1 2 and 3 now we will understand each of these categories first let us take category 1 under this category the alternate investment funds are invested in small and medium sized enterprises startups and new economically viable corporations with high growth potential the government encourages investments in these categories as they have a positive impact on the economy with regards to high output and job creation some of the important funds in this category 1 include infrastructure fund venture capital fund angel fund and social venture fund now moving on to see category 2 under this category the alternate investment funds are invested in equity securities and debt securities apart from this those funds that are not covered under category 1 and 3 are also included in category 2 debt funds funds of funds and private equity funds are some of the funds included in this category now finally let us see about category 3 see under this category the funds are usually engaged in many complex trading techniques like investing in listed or unlisted derivatives these funds provide returns only for a short period of time private investment in public equity fund and hedge funds are some of the funds that are included in category 3 so this is all about the categories of aifs now before concluding our discussion let us understand some benefits of investing in aifs see the alternate investment funds provide a higher return than conventional investments apart from this the aifs have low volatility see the aifs are not directly related to stock markets so the volatility in these funds is very less when compared with traditional equity investments so that's all regarding this discussion now we will take up the next news article look at this news article in order to deal with the rush during summer holidays the indian railways have sanctioned 6369 trips involving 380 special trains in this context let us quickly go through the national rail plan 2030 see the government of india released the draft national rail plan in december 2020 this document seeks to address certain lacunae in the indian railway system and it also sets out targets to achieve in that line the national rail plan offers a long term perspective plan for boosting the railway network in india The vision of the National Rail Plan is to develop capacity infrastructure and enhance rail freight share ahead of the demand. It also aims to develop capacity by 2030 that will cater to the expanding demand up to 2050. One of the key tasks of the plan was to map the entire Indian railway network at the GIS platform that is geographical information system platform. This gigantic exercise was carried out as a part of the study and the entire network was mapped on the GIS platform. Some of the other objectives of the plan are displayed here. You can go through it. As part of the National Rail Plan, Vision 2024 has also been launched for accelerated implementation of certain critical projects by 2024. some of the key projects include 100% electrification by december 2030 multi tracking congested routes upgrade of speed in the delhi mumbai and delhi howrah routes to 160 km per hour upgrade of speed on all other golden quadrilateral and golden diagonal routes to 130 km per hour 
elimination of all level crossings on the golden quadrilateral golden diagonal routes so talking about the significance of the plan see the national freight activity will grow five fold by 2050 so india's freight transport ecosystem has a critical role to play in supporting india's ambitious priorities which includes global competitiveness job growth so on and so forth so with this understanding now we will take up the next news article for our discussion take a look at this news article this news article reports about the death of three persons who were killed in two incidents of wild gore attacks in kerala so in this news article discussion let us quickly learn about wild gore see the wild gore also known as the indian bison is a large animal native to south asia and southeast asia it's the biggest type of bovine and it is taller than other wild cattle species there are different names for gaur in different regions for example the malayan gaur is called seladong and the burmese gaur is called piong the domesticated form of gaur is called gael or mithun the gaur is listed as a vulnerable species on the iucn red list because its population has declined by over 70 percentage in some areas over the past few generations gourds can be found in forested hills and grassy areas of south and southeast asia including burma and thailand unfortunately they are regionally extinct in sri lanka the worldwide population of gourds is estimated to be between 13000 and 30000 and around 80 percentage of them are in india the western guards in southern india is one of the main areas where these gourds are found in india the gourd is the state animal of goa and bihar gourds are one of the largest land animals with a length of 8.2 to 10.8 feet and a height of 5.41 to 7.2 feet at the shoulder also they have a tail that is 28 to 41 inches long on average gores weigh between 650 to 1000 kilograms then male gores are actually larger and heavier than females both males and females have horns that grow from sides of their heads and curve upwards gores are basically diurnal but they have become more nocturnal due to disturbances caused by humans in their habitats then gore herds are led by an older female which means they are matriarchal while adult males are often solitary gores give birth to one calf sometimes two after a gestation period of about nine months so these calves are weaned after seven to twelve months Gores reach sexual maturity in their second or third year. In captivity, gores can live up to 30 years. The gores diet mainly consists of upper portion of plants such as green leaves, stems, seeds and flowers. So I hope that helps. Let me know if you have any other questions. With this, we will take up the next news article for our discussion. Now look at this news article. See, we all know that our Prime Minister Mr. Modi left for Japan yesterday to attend the G7 summit. The summit is scheduled to be held in Hiroshima from May 19 to 21. India is a special invitee to the summit. The article here says that since India holds G20 presidency, it would be easy for India to align the G20 agenda with Japan's agenda for the G7 summit. Now, in this context, let us learn few facts about G7. See, G7 is an informal grouping of seven of the world's advanced economies. They are United States, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the United Kingdom, as well as the European Union. Note that the European Union is a non-enumerated member and therefore it does not assume the rotating G7 presidency. But however, it still attends the annual summit of G7. Also note that China has never been a member despite its large economy and world's biggest population. G7 represents 40% of global GDP and 10% of the world's population. 
unlike other bodies like NATO, G7 has no legal existence. In addition to this, it even lacks a permanent secretariat. It also has no binding impact on policy. The policies, decisions and commitments need to be ratified independently by governing bodies of member states. Now let us see a little bit about the history and the evolution of G7. See, the origin of G7 dates back to a meeting between the US, UK, Italy, France, Germany and Japan that took place in the year 1975. At that time, the global economy was in a state of recession due to the OPEC oil embargo. OPEC placed an oil embargo on the West due to the Israel-Egypt war. So this resulted in an energy crisis in the West. As the energy crisis was escalating, the US decided that it would be beneficial for the large players on the world stage to coordinate with each other on macroeconomic initiatives. So this is why the six countries had a meeting. After this first summit, the countries agreed to meet annually and a year later, Canada was invited into the group and this marked the official formation of the G7 as we know it now. The president of the European Commission was asked to join the meetings in 1977. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, Russia was also invited to join the group in 1998. Thereafter, the group was named the G8. After that, in 2014, Russia was expelled for its annexation of Crimea from Ukraine. So after 2014, the G8 again became G7. Now, let's look at the presidency of the G7 grouping. The presidency of G7 meetings is held by each of the seven countries in turn each year. The country holding the presidency is responsible for organizing and hosting the meeting. See, Japan took over the presidency of the G7 from January 2023. In each G7 summit, the host country can invite some guests. As you see here, this year, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Australia, Brazil, Republic of Korea, Comoros and Cook Islands have been invited to attend the G7 summit as participating guests. Moving forward, let us see about the evolution of G7's agenda. The G7 summit provides a forum for member countries to discuss shared values and concerns. In the 1980s, the G7 mainly focused on international economic policy. But right now, the G7 extended its mandate to include issues related to foreign policy and security as well. In recent years, G7 have met to formulate common responses to challenges encompassing counter-terrorism, development, education, health, human rights and climate change. That's all for this news article discussion. Now we will move on to solve the practice questions. Today we have six questions. Five questions will be discussed by me and one will be the practice question for the day. Question number one. Consider the following statements regarding the 2000 rupees note. Statement number one, it has been introduced under the section 24.1 of the RBI Act 1934. Statement number two, Chandrayaan is the motive present at the backside of rupees 2000 notes. Which of the statements given above SRR incorrect? See, here statement number one is correct. The 2000 rupees note was introduced in November 2016 under section 24.1 of the RBI Act 1934. This was done to meet the currency requirement of the country after demonetization. Then statement number 2 is incorrect. It says that Chandrayaan is the motive present at the backside. But actually it is Mangalyan. So this statement is incorrect. The question asks for incorrect statement. So the answer for this question is option B, 2 only. Question number 2. Which of the following countries are members of both G7 and G20? Canada, Australia, France. Select the correct answer using the course given below. See, like G7, G20 is also an informal grouping. It consists of 19 countries and European Union. It also has representatives from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Its membership includes Argentina, Australia, Brazil, 
கனடா சைனா பிரான்ஸ் ஜெர்மனி இந்தியா இண்டோனேஷியா இட்டாலி ஜப்பான் ரிபப்ளிக் ஆஃப் கொரியா மெக்சிகோ ரஷ்யா சவுதி அரேபியா சவுத் ஆப்ரிக்கா டர்க்கி த யுனைடெட் கிங்டம் அண்ட் த யுனைடெட் ஸ்டேட்ஸ் அலாங் வித் திஸ் வி ஆல்சோ ஹாவ் த யூரோப்பியன் யூனியன் ஹியர் யூ கேன் சி தேட் ஆல் த ஜி செவன் மெம்பர்ஸ் ஆர் பார்ட் ஆஃப் ஜி டுவெண்ட்டி த கரெக்ட் ஆன்சர் ஃபார் திஸ் கொஸ்டின் இஸ் ஆப்ஷன் டி ஒன் அண்ட் த்ரீ ஓன்லி கொஸ்டின் நம்பர் த்ரீ Consider the following statements about alternate investment funds. Statement number 1 in India they are currently regulated by Securities and Exchange Board of India that is SEBI. Statement number 2 the AIFs are highly volatile as they are directly linked to the stock markets. Which of the statements given above is are correct? Here statement number 1 is correct. In India the AIFs are regulated by the Securities and Exchange Board of India. and statement number 2 is incorrect we saw in the discussion itself that aifs have low volatility because they are not directly linked to stock market here the question is asking for correct statement so the correct answer for this question is option a one only question number 4 with reference to the national rail plan consider the following statements statement number 1 it was announced in budget 2023 statement number 2 As part of the National Rail Plan, Vision 2024 has been launched for accelerated implementation of certain critical projects by 2024. Which of the statements given above is or are incorrect? Here the question asks for incorrect statement. See, the plan was prepared by Indian Railways. The National Railway Plan is aimed to formulate strategies based on both operational capacities and commercial policy initiatives to increase the share of railways in freight to 45%. Here statement 1 is alone incorrect. Statement 2 is correct. We saw this in the discussion itself. So the correct answer for this question is option A, one only. Question number 5. This is a 2014 prelims question. The power to increase the number of judges in the Supreme Court of India is vested in See the answer for this question is in article 124 the clause 1 of the article says that the parliament by law prescribes a number of judges in the supreme court so the correct answer for this question is option b the parliament question number 6 this is a quiz question for the day we learnt about wild card in the discussion pause the video and read the question carefully post your answers in the comment box below displayed here are the main question for your practice Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment box below. If you have found a video to be useful, like the video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel. Happy learning.